Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on revisiting counter narcotics policy in the Western Hemisphere. Before we formally begin, let's take care of some logistics. This event will last approximately 60 minutes. Following panelists' remarks and a moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. Please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions link on the event webpage or use the Ask Questions function in Zoom. We will have simultaneous interpretation of both Spanish and English available during this event. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, please click the globe button that says interpretation and then select the language that you wish, and to, li wish to listen in to. So again, good afternoon. Thank you again for joining us today for a discussion revisiting counter narcotics policy in the Western Hemisphere. The global consensus on the need to counter illicit drugs is weakening. At the same time, we're confronting surging threats, especially in the Western Hemisphere, from rising narcotics trafficking and production. At a time where allies and partners are more vital than ever, many political leaders such as Colombia's Gustavo Petro and Mexico's Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador have softened their policies towards illicit drugs and encouraged new conversations, bad conversations in my book, on broadly overhauling drug policy. I think this is a mistake. Illicit narcotics are a great evil. Um, there are, it's complicated and hard and progress is difficult, but guess what? Progress is difficult on fighting global corruption. No one talks about legalizing global corruption. Progress is difficult on global counter proliferation of nuclear weapons. No one talks about legalizing nuclear weapons, even though these are difficult bad things to fight these global bads like illegal narcotics, we continue to push against them for some reason. And I can think of some reasons that they're all bad reasons. There has been a softening and a weakening of the global consensus. We need to recommit to pushing back against illegal narcotics. That's why we published a short, a recent short paper on this topic that I authored at CSIS because I feel strongly about this. And this is why we're convening this meeting today. I'm really grateful to the panelists who are gonna who are gonna help us unpack this really interesting topic and this very important topic. So we've got several smart people that are going to help us with this. The first is our panelist is Ambassador Anthony Earl, Anthony Wayne, who goes by Ambassador Tony Wayne. Ambassador Wayne is a senior advisor at CSIS with the Project on Prosperity and Development, and he served as a U.S. diplomat from 1975 to 2015. He is currently also a policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Um, he was U.S. ambassador to Argentina. He was U.S. ambassador to Mexico. He was the quarterback on all of our assistance in Afghanistan. He was Assistant Secretary for Economic Affairs. He's a friend and a colleague, and I'm so grateful Ambassador Wayne is here today. Then we have one of the people I most admire in Washington, Ambassador Ann Patterson. Ambassador Patterson currently serves in the Commission on the National Defense Strategy for the United States as the Kissinger Senior Fellow at Yale University. She had an amazing career in Washington. She was Assistant Secretary for the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs from 2005 to 2007. She had a number of ambassador, important ambassadorial posts. She's someone I listen to and admire, and I'm really grateful that she would take out of her busy schedule to be with us today. Finally is a new friend of mine, Admiral Alvaro Echandia Duran. Admiral Echandia is a recognized expert on the role of civil intelligence in a democracy and why we should renew our commitment to counter narcotics. So he and I are on the same page on this. Throughout his career, the Admiral has held various high-level positions, including Chief of Naval Operations of Colombia's National Armada, Chief of Staff of the Caribbean Naval Force, Chief of Naval Intelligence, and Chief of Joint Military Intelligence and Counterintelligence of the Armed Forces. Admiral Echendia is a hero and is someone who is a great friend of the United States and has taken on really dangerous and tough problems and has made his country more secure and more prosperous. And um, his country owes a debt, the, the country of Colombia owes a debt to Admiral Echendia. And for, for us, the, the problems of, count, of countering narcotics is a collective action problem that requires friends and partners. So we thought it was important to have a voice from a partner 
to be on this panel. So I'm so grateful to have the three of you today to help talk about this challenge. Let me first turn to Ambassador Wayne. Ambassador Wayne, I thought I'd give you a chance to make some initial remarks about this. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a great pleasure to be here with such wonderful colleagues and talking about this. So first, let me say that it's been clear for a while that we need to have a more adaptive and more agile long-term strategy for dealing with counter-narcotics. And, and part of that is a recognition that a number of the policies and steps we've taken have been counterproductive and they have not produced the results that we would like to see. So it, I, I was happy to help participate in the Western Hemisphere Drug Policy Commission when they were doing their preparations a couple of years ago for their final report, which is a very good report. I recommend it to everybody. But what was clear was that we needed to draw some new lessons. That didn't mean turning away from the importance of illicit drugs coming in. It's just being smarter about how we were going through this. And so a number of the conclusions that have come up, some of them are focused on the United States, that we needed to coordinate better across all the agencies in the United States. I'm sure some of us have seen that lack of coordination because many agencies have a responsibility for countering drugs. Um, and the other idea is to try to get to a situation where you really have sort of a compact with partner countries where you're dealing with commitments that we make and that they make together and uh, it to find the best way forward in dealing with both supply and demand. And in that connection, one of the big complaints consistently about the United States has been we're not dealing with the demand in the United States. And I would hear this regularly in Mexico. They would say, well, we are asking us to do all this stuff, but you guys are just sucking up all the drugs and paying for them. And so we face these well-oiled and well-funded cartels. Well, one thing I, I do wanna say for this new administration is they are investing deeply on the demand side. They've asked for over $40 billion in programs to help address um, care needs, recovery needs, ad addiction problems, the attraction of addiction. And, and that's the right kind of step. And what it does is it gives us, as the United States, more credibility to go out to other countries and say, okay, look, we're dealing with this demand side. Now you have to help us work with the supply side. Let's find the best ways to go forward. Um, I just know very interestingly, uh, Anthony Blinken, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State was in Colombia this week. I know we'll hear from the Admiral about this, but they were really talking through the elements of what would be a multifaceted compact of looking at the problems of poor peasants, of looking at the problems of violence, and talking about the need for effective law enforcement and even extradition still to be used as part of those tools as you go forward. So I think one part of the U.S. policy does have to be dealing with what we sometimes call the root causes, whether it's the root causes of migration or the root causes of drug production and trafficking. There's a, there are a lot of poorly governed spaces with poor people um, who, in some ways, often get trapped and become the victims of the, the, the narco trafficking going forward. So that does need to be uh, it needs to be looked at, but that's a long-term strategy. In the short term, you've still got to be very good at law enforcement, at interdiction, at bringing criminals to justice, at ending impunity and human rights violations and other things that, that we see in, in many parts of the world where there are big flows of drugs going on. And so in part, that's the real challenge is even if you've got the big picture right, that we have to deal with supply and demand and we have to deal with root causes, you have to deal with the intermediate term, people that are dying now. As Dan wrote in his article, fentanyl has been, so, uh, over, has been a, a soaring problem, creating more and more overdose deaths in the United States. And violence in a number of these countries in Colombia and in Mexico has also been very high, much of it fueled by criminal cartels. Not all of it, but a lot of it fueled by that. So um, as I say, we're moving, I think, toward this, this under, trying to build this understanding with Colombia. With Mexico, very interestingly, a year ago, 
we had a U.S.-Mexico high-level security dialogue. That was reframing the partnership to try and rebuild trust, which had deteriorated over the previous four or five years. And the idea was in this that both sides would make a number of commitments, both on these sort of deep, basic social programs, but also on justice and law enforcement and interdictions, and that they would agree on objectives and an action plan going forward. Well, they did agree on a set of objectives in January of this year, and they're going to be meeting, I believe, later this week to look at at where they are now. And and what we really need to see and look for is, is there concrete evidence of progress? Because one of the things we have to do if we're approaching this is really measure the results because it's people's lives. And and very sadly, what we've seen over this this last year is continued uh, rises in the amount of fentanyl seized on the southwest border between the United States and Mexico, for example. So that's not very encouraging that we're, we're seeing success here. But we have to look for that success. We have, have to then go back and, and try to improve this cooperation. We have a number of voices in the United States that say if this cooperative approach is not working. We have to consider using our sanctions in a more targeted way, a more effective way, bring pressure to try to get improved performance. And that needs to be part of the debate as we go forward. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador Wayne. Thanks so much. Ambassador Patterson, over to you. Ambassador Patterson. Oh, you're on mute. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Tony and Admiral, for hosting this panel. And I hope it'll be the start of a renewed dialogue on this topic because I think taking our collective eye off this issue has risked not only for the well-being of American citizens, but also for U.S. national security. I think much of the debate about our counter-drug policy in Latin America has become complained with U.S. domestic issues. The fact that drug penalties fall disproportionately on minority men, on excesses by police, again, often against minorities, and abuses and asset forfeiture. Overdose deaths in the U.S. reached record highs last year, and despite increases in spending on treatment, the last ONDCP report said that only 6.5% of addicts have access to it. So frustration levels are high in the U.S., and this, in my view, has led to misguided calls for legalization. People say, just get the illegal revenue out of the drug business and violence will disappear. But frustration is also high in Latin America because of violence and crime. And it's easy to blame policies allegedly imposed by the United States. Violence in Mexico is at an all time high and cocoa production and violence in Colombia is increasing again. Increased immigration, gang warfare, a rollback of democracy in Latin America from both the right and the left is not in the interest of the U.S. from a strategic, economic, or humanitarian standpoint. I I thought it might be useful to review why Plan Colombia was successful in reducing violence in Colombia and, let's not forget, in reducing cocaine trafficking to the U.S., at least temporarily reducing cocaine consumption as supply constricted. I think it's it's hard to, we tend to forget how bad things were when things started Plan Colombia. We had started in 2000. The guerrillas and paramilitaries had degenerated into large drug trafficking organizations. And really, Colombia was on the verge of being a failed state. I know there were mistakes made, and I think we should talk more about those. But but let me focus on on what worked, because I think these lessons are worthy of a renewed look. First, the U.S. focus was on restoring security in the countryside, not just getting rid of drugs. No Colombian peasant was going to stop growing coca unless he was no longer threatened by cartels and able to achieve a modicum of personal security. This was why it was so important to professionalize the police, expand the military, and aid the prosecutor's office. Second, Plan Colombia, and this was really more by accident and design, also had the flexibility and resources to focus on other generators of violence like attacks against the export pipeline and kidnappings 
and joint U.S.-Colombian programs were developed to address these crimes. This reinforced a virtual circle of professional military police and prosecutor's office. Third, serious law enforcement expertise was critically important. None of these other programs would have worked without courts and, if I can say, extraordinarily brave prosecutors. Yes, the military and police would pick up people who attacked the pipeline, but unless they were charged and convicted in a court, the policy would have failed. This takes years to develop expertise in forensics, case management, and all the, um, the skills that go with it. Fourth, I think an important element of law enforcement was extradition to the U.S. This is not only for drug trackers, traffickers, but also for violent criminals. This really came into effect in Colombia in 1997 after years of debate. But the extradition of a country's nationals was also much disputed in El Salvador and Mexico and other Latin American countries. Before extradition was enforced in Colombia, the kingpins were allowed to supposedly surrender themselves to the Colombian government. And we all know how that turned out. Fifth, successful policies cost money, but money alone is not sufficient. People talk a lot, I was telling Ambassador Wayne about the violence in Mexico, uh, as if the US had poured billions of dollars into this and insisted on the militarization. As far as I can tell, the US spent about $12 billion in Colombia and about a quarter of that in Mexico, a country with four times the GDP and about three times the population. And it isn't just money from the US, but from the countries themselves, as they need to raise taxes, increase police salaries, et cetera. And I might add that these investments overseas are tiny compared to what the U.S. spends on domestic counter drug programs, not to mention the enormous human cost of addiction. And six, any policy, and I'll stop here, requires strategic patience and gains can be easily reversed. We have to be in this for the long term. The U.S. has been deeply invested in Colombia for more than 20 years and cocoa production has regrettably now reached close to the levels of 2000. These are deeply rooted societal issues in Latin America and in our own country, and addressing them requires persistence and patience. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador. I'm very grateful for that. Thanks. And Admiral, thanks for being here. I'd welcome your, your views on this. I know you have a, a multi-dimensional perspective on this topic. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I would like to, to start talking about the legalization. I think that the pro-legalization persons, NGOs, or even governments normally have a very poor approach of the problem. This is not just a war and defines who wins and who lost the war. And it's not just a social problem that uh, many leaders wants to define today as a social problem. It's a national security issue uh, that has all the components with any national security. The approach is more comprehensive and should be able to include the rule of law, the health care problems, national security, the economic components, uh, the public opinion, and many more, many more involved in the plan and how to deal in effective with, with, with the narcotics. Uh, I think it's a mistake and it's unfairly uh, to say that the war on drugs has failed. But unfortunately, today there is a trend in that direction. There's uh, too many leaders today, especially in South America, talking about the uh, the drug on wars has been lost. Uh, I think that recently President Petro is calling for a summit that includes all Andean community nations to discuss the policy on drugs. He argues that uh, that became one of the most, Colombia has become one of the most violent nations in the world. But he refused to know that the legalization of the drug could drive a worsened situation. So it's definitely the legalization of the drugs is, is not, it's not the right path, I think. Uh, I'm not a theoretician, but there are an issue that sometimes wasn't mentioned like a closer with Trinity. He says that the 
chaos of a war has been described as the tension between three fundamental elements, the government, the people, and the army. But who is the government in this war? United States, United States with allies, United States allies and many other groups. Who's the people? It's uh, different cultures, NGOs with different agenda, uh, many people who make lobby for drugs, and the army. That's normally the army is the people who is in the field and heavily exposed to corruption, the motivation for the lack of assets. So in terms of Clausewitz, it's not who wins the war. It's not, a, it's not an easy war. He says that the strategy is about to pick in the right battles and tactics is about to successfully execute those battles. I think we have won many battles and we have lost some of them. But even if we don't pick up the right battles, it doesn't mean that we, we lost the war. So we must continue working on that direction. Uh, talking about the recent visit to the Secretary Blinken to Bogota, I was, uh, I, I saw very close uh, the, the, what the President Petro says, and I saw a slight change of the, the first position. I, I guess the first position was a, uh, was a speech of the campaign, and now it's a speech of the, of the government. For example, he, today he argues that there is a war. Yes, that is a war, and the war must continue. The war on drugs must continue. So he agrees with the drugs on wars. And he mentioned that uh, we need a maritime interdiction. I like, matter of fact, I, buy that, I like that very much because I've been working uh, a lot of my career is trying to get resources for the maritime interdiction because 90% of the drugs are shipped by sea. And now this government is talking about that. Intelligence, he's talking about intelligence. And he said that the intelligence needs to be strengthened uh, to work on war on drugs. And this is very important in all levels of intelligence. Uh, we have a very good experience with Jarab South, and I think do, we need to work in that direction and to maybe rethink something to stretch that intelligence at sea. Uh, he pointed out that the difference on narcotics is divided in two big groups. One group is the, the poorest uh, farmers, that are displaced and that are forces to uh, crop uh, the drugs. And the other group is the real owners of the drugs. And he said that these real owners of the drugs are, are normally people who is uh, very close to the high power. And I agree with that. In my experience, there is a, very high level of person of the government and, and the political side involved in drugs. They don't use camouflage. They don't use rifles, but they, they, move the, 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 they move the things about drugs. So we think that it's very important to prosecute that, that persons and also to have a uh, task force, an international task force for money laundering. Money laundering is, it's amazing how much money moves the drugs. So we need to, to track that with intelligence, with a multitasking agency that can manage and can handle that, inf that information. Thanks, Admiral. Okay, let me put a couple of questions to this group. The first is, I hear a lot about the People's Republic of China 
as a major source of the prep, what are called the chemical precursors, the chemical building blocks used for manufacturing fentanyl and other synthetic drugs. Uh, the People's Republic of China has also recently announced it would be suspending cooperation with the United States on counter narcotics policy. How does the illegal nar illicit narcotics trade intersect with rising great power competition? I, let me put that out to, to all of you. Let me start with you, Ambassador Wayne, but I'd welcome all three of you to, re to respond to that question. Well, certainly the the major flow of fentanyl and other synthetic opioids is coming in from Mexico. And most of that is made now in Mexico, but with precursor chemicals that are coming from China, some from India, but mostly from China. And um, there was a period of time when the Chinese were uh, cooperating, were issuing new regulations, were cracking down on some of these chemical companies. Um, but that's less clear now, especially with this statement, which is a very short-sighted statement by the Chinese that they're not going to cooperate against uh, counter-narcotics because these drugs, of course, are targeting uh, many innocent civilians and killing many of them. And at this time, they are flowing through, in Mexico, there are these two large cartels, the Sinaloa cartel and the Nueva Generación de Jalisco cartel. And they're just pushing that into the United States and through Mexico, through the United States. They have networks on both sides of the border. And this needs to be stopped. And the best way to stop it, uh, one of the best ways to stop it would be to stop the precursors, making it harder for the precursors to get there. You might not be able to stop it because some people are always going to make money by sending it, but you could be a lot more effective on the Chinese side of controlling your chemical companies. Then you get to all the steps where you should be inter intercepting those, those chemicals as they're moving through Mexico, as they're turning into pills, as they're getting to the United States, as they cross the border and move up. And you have to be effective at every step along that way. And this isn't a question of a supposedly harmless drug. This is a tremendously deadly drug, and people are de developing more deadly versions of this synthetically on a regular basis. That makes it very easy to produce and easy to transport because you only need little teeny bits of it to supply a large number of users. Over. Ambassador Patterson. So, so Dan, I um, I hadn't served in Latin America for about 20 years, but I had occasion to look at this issue recently. And let me put it this way. I've been astonished at the Chinese inroads into the hemisphere. Absolutely astonished is how, how this has expanded in the past 20 years. And I would say this coincided with uh, the, the war on terror and the, all the wars in the Middle East. So the U.S. took the, took its eye off this part of the world quite dramatically. And now we have a situation where we're playing catch up. Uh, so I would, so this is a bigger issue than narcotics. But we've got to reassert ourselves in Latin America, not only in counter narcotics, but also in trade and all sorts of, of relationships that we've let atrophy over the years. And I'll stop there. Admiral. Uh, I think that uh, China doesn't have the willing to cooperate to collaborate because as as uh as you told her in your paper uh there is 160 thousand companies in china that produce components to make fentanyl so they are not interested to stop those uh chemical companies so this for that side needs to be handle it at the highest level with sanctions but i think in the operational level i agree with ambassador wayne that most of the drops comes to uh mexico for the mexican cartels and they uh, produce the drugs in very easy very cheap very fast way and send it to the united states so it needs to close uh, to work very close to Mexican government and uh, make a lot of pressure about these drugs because uh, the, uh, as, as I usually said, the war on marijuana is a 
trench battle. The war on cocaine is a artillery battle, but the drugs on fentanyl is a Star Wars reality. So it's something that is like talking about the uh, hypersonic uh, multi-head missiles, talking to a uh, compared to a rifle. It's, it's something that that is it's crazy. Uh, so it's it's I think it needs to be addressed to the Mexican government and with a lot of pressure about that because this it, it's small company, it's small amounts can make up big damage in the society. Uh, there was something like 100,000 Americans died last year from drug overdoses. That's more than twice what we lost in the Vietnam War. I, I can think of, I'm one degree of separation from at least three people I know who've died of drug overdoses in the last three years. And I suspect that most Americans are in a similar situation where they are one degree or even close, they know somebody close to them who's died from a drug overdose. This has uh, become a, a, a burning issue. And it's something that I think we need to take with, with a lot more uh, seriousness. I like the term, someone used the term strategic patience. Let me come back to what I said in my paper and what I've said at the beginning, which is no one says we have lost the war on global corruption. No one says we've lost the war on nuclear nonproliferation. I never hear that. I've never heard that ever. I've been in this business for 20 years. I've never heard anyone say, let's give up on the war on global corruption. Let's give up on nuclear non-proliferation. They are intractable, difficult problems that require strategic patience. I would argue that illicit narcotics is in the same category, but I don't feel as if I, I that it's it's it, that you get the same kind of consensus on that on this issue. Is there a better way, a more productive framework to approach this, to, to achieve the strategic patience? Let me start with you, Admiral, and then let me go to the two ambassadors. I think that the, the problem is uh, talking about corruption, talking about uh, uh, proliferation, weapons of mass destruction. It's something that socially is not accepted. The problem that we have today is that many drugs are socially accepted are socially like a, many uh artists musicians use drugs and it's not it's it, they move uh the uh how bad is it so they the people think that it's not that bad because many people use it but we need i remember in colombia uh I think about 20 years ago, make a, uh, an advertising, how bad is the drugs? Uh, let me tell you something. If it just, if many people who use cocaine know or so how they build the cocaine, how they make, how they use gasoline, how they use cement, how they use a, a bunch of chemicals and they are, putting this bunch of chemicals inside the body. I think it is a campaign that needs to be done, uh, telling the people how bad are the drugs. Uh, I think that the, the marijuana is something that uh, is it's heavily accepted today, but we need to strengthen the fight in cocaine, and the fentanyl and, and, and those kind of drugs and show the people how bad it is. Make a, a, a invest in advertising and show the people real examples and how bad it is and how harmful it is for the health. Thank you. A Ambassador Patterson. So Daniel, I think the unfortunate truth is this is sort of very much linked to what's caused engagement with latin america is is spikes in deaths in the united states is when lynn bias years ago and the crack cocaine in inner cities when you had enormous uh death rates and now i think we're getting that same attention attention from fentanyl because a hundred thousand deaths is actually a record that surpasses anything we saw from heroin or cocaine usage in latin america so it will generate political attention maybe of the wrong sort 
The other driver of this that we're not looking at very much is a driver for immigration. Everyone's talking about the, the border that's out of control. When you look at places like El Salvador and Central America, they're not big producers of, of, uh, of drugs, but there's a lot of intra-gang warfare about the drug, the drug issue. So I think there are other ways we could we could ways we could recast this argument, but I think unfortunately it's often seen as a question of U.S. Uh, lethality. Ambassador Wayne. Well, I I did in a sense like the earlier point the admiral made about the different kind of weapons. What we've seen in the war on drugs is it's evolved in the kind of of combat, the kind of struggle that's going on. These drugs are much more lethal today. They're much more easy to smuggle. Uh, and the, the harm caused, as we just said, was, was much greater. Um, just to, to note the, the number of people who died from fentanyl and other synthetic opioids out of that 109,000 was 60 to 70,000. And the rest were dying from heroin and other kind of, of drug abuses. But it's still an all-time high. So as long as you have that human harm going on, you can't just put this aside. You have to use it, all the different tools you have, but you can use these tools more smartly. And I think that's what that's what needs to be reflected on, and that what that's what needs to be put into effect. Now I do get, I give the new administration credit for trying to do that on the domestic side and trying to build these partnerships, but the partnerships actually have to work and deliver. And that means you need partners who are willing to also go after the weaknesses in their own system, the corruption that's made possible by all this drug money and other things, it still has to be dealt with. The impunity of, a just, of justice systems that don't work, that don't deliver convictions needs to be dealt with because that doesn't just, that's not just hurting the United States, it's hurting citizens in each of their countries. And and we need to have international partnerships in this because no one country can solve these problems on their own. They're all too interconnected. If we can get it down to the size that one country can, can solve it, that would be a big step forward. But we're not there now. We're at this place right now where we need deeper, more trusting partnerships, not more independence and less trust between the societies that are suffering from these drugs and the groups that traffic them. Great, okay. Uh, look, the United States has a strong history of partnership with countries in the Western hemisphere combating illegal narcotics, but some heads of state in the region have called for a re-examination of this cooperation. What are the options for the United States and other countries as the landscape in the hemisphere changes? Ambassador Wayne, let me go to you first about this. Well, I think first thing is there is a, there are some constants here in the enforcement area. You need good intelligence if you're going to go after these criminal groups. That means you have to have intelligence agencies that can trust each other. And you need to have the ability to investigate criminals successfully. And you need to take those investigations forward and get the bad folk that are going on. You also then need new and deeper collaborations between the folk who are dealing with the treatment of those who abuse drugs or of those who are being abused you know, or misused in certain parts of the country and, and coerced by the drug trafficking cartels and their allies, their local gangs. You know, you, there's great harm going on, just people suffering, and you need to help do that. Now, that has to be done largely by the host government. but you could provide training and capacity building, and we've been trying to do that for, for a while. We're still trying to do that over a whole number of areas. And then just to mention, in, among various countries, it does help to have accepted and shared commitments and norms as you go forward. So people are actually working on the same broad strategy, even if their own different levels of capacity. But you need to be all, all pushing in the same direction and get as much as a consensus as you can, sharing of best practices, and then confidentially sharing of, of intelligence as that is possible as you build these more trusting relationships. Admiral, what is your take on this? Uh, I think that the, 
for the intelligence in order to be effective needs to be worked one by one case. Uh, I learned many years ago that when you share intelligence with many people, with the large groups, you share nothing. So intelligence is effective, like uh, when you share intelligence like US, UK, that's good, two countries together. And then if the United States needs to share with someone else, United States with that country. The problem that we have is we trying to make large groups to share intelligence and it doesn't work. The, the, the intelligence needs to take one by one, one by one. And the other thing is that there are different points of view today in the governments. So I think we need to take what we have in common and start working and stretch those, those points that we have in common and then talk about the points that are different and negotiate those points. So, but there are, for example, in Colombia, as I told you before, there are things that, that we have in common with the United States. I mean, the Colombian government and the US government. We have a war, we need more shared intelligence, and we need more interdiction at sea and the air interdiction. So we need, today we can start working very hard on it and negotiate about extradition, about eradication, because we need to go forward, but we need to start what we have in common today. Right. Ambassador Patterson. So, so I think I think some of these Latin American leaders who are talking about a different policy may rethink that, or they may talk a good game. And and I think the example of Colombia is a good one. There's much talk about blocking extradition, but people are still being extradited, which is a good sign. And I entirely agree with the Admiral of finding things that are in common and putting aside the most controversial parts of the policy, like eradication. Uh, for later discussion. That's actually hard for Americans to do, uh, but to focus on the the, the vectors of, of agreement, uh, particularly with some of these uh, uh, new governments in the hemisphere, is going to be is going to be important and not sort of revert back to to our standard policy. Um, it does have to evolve. I'll ask one more question, then I've got some questions from the audience. It's kind of a combined question. There have been various social movements in the last 50 years to stigmatize bad behaviors. I'm thinking about litter campaigns. I'm thinking about the use of tobacco. I'm thinking about certain kinds of food that we eat and other behavioral changes, right? It seems to me that there should be some ability to re-stigmatize some of these behaviors of narcotics use. There seems to be almost sort of like a vac we're vacating the space on applying sort of judgment on this. Say so this is a bad thing, just like it's bad to people have no problem saying don't smoke a cigarette. But I have a funny there's sort of a, a mealy mouth feel to some of the conversations I hear about illicit narcotics. I don't get it. People are perfectly happy to say, I don't think you should have that big gulp. And I think it's really bad that you litter. But I don't understand why I get these sort of these kind of half measured statements about illegal narcotics. I find it very, very puzzling and very disturbing. And so long as there's a demand for drugs, and some of it could be, I believe, temperate if we had a stigmatization campaign, and, uh, and it may be in partnership with others, and I think we should talk about this, the production and trafficking of illegal narcotics will continue. How can the United States improve upon its commitment to shared responsibility in reducing U.S. domestic demand for illicit drugs. And, and Ambassador Wayne, you made some references, but let me start with you, Ambassador Patterson. So what we've seen is we can cut down quite apart from the, the name and shame approach. We can cut down on, on various elements of this over years. Certainly cocaine uh, consumption dropped dramatically, uh, 2006, 2012, roughly like that. Methamphetamine uh, consumption also dropped because it was it was made the sort of stuff you buy in drugstores was made illegal and that made it that made a difference in sort of 
labs in my home state of places like Arkansas. So you can do this. I don't know how we, to, I, I'm, Dan, I'm just as amazed as you are about this, how it's become sort of socially acceptable, uh, but it has. And, and I've been surprised at some of the, the wide popularity for legalization campaigns. And, and let's be candid here, this doesn't go without being noticed in, among our partners too, because then they say, well, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. I don't know how to change the narrative on this. Admiral? I think we need to, to tell the people, uh, how much crime, corruption, violence are behind the drugs. To buy a drug at the street is not like to buy a hot dog. So, and, and, and that's the problem that the drugs became more social acceptable. So we need to show the people how bad and how much crime are behind, how much people are killed, how much corruption are in the, at the highest levels. So, and when the people buy drugs on the streets, they are collaborating for that. There are uh, some uh, figures that are amazing. For example, one, one kilogram of cocaine in Colombia costs $1,200, one, almost $1,000. If you compare this, when this kilogram reached Mexico, Cost twelve thousand dollars, and just crossing the border to the United States is twenty six thousand dollars, and then these kilograms is cutted and mixed in twenty five percent purity. So from one kilogram you make four kilograms, and one gram in the streets costs roughly one hundred dollars. You know what that means? That matter means that the right the price from one thousand dollar in the source rise to four hundred thousand dollars. This is amazing, and we need to tell the people that. And we need how many people are killed to reach this kilogram of cocaine to the United States? How bad is the drugs? I'm sorry, I think Ambassador Wayne. Yeah, no, I agree with all of that. Uh, and I do go back to your original point, Dan. Um, there needs to be a, a more concerted effort to have a national campaign of education for people about all the dangers, the costs in this country and the costs in other countries from this whole criminal network that is supplying this. Uh, I think that not enough people in communities really know this. Now, some of this new money is going into education campaigns, but I, I think the size and the scope has to be bigger, and it does need to get to the level that we had for cigarettes. And remember, it took a while for cigarettes, right? It took a while to get people off cigarettes, but we started off by putting warnings on. We could put warnings on in that case. The one other area I want to mention that I, I, I think I'm best. Put, put, put the posters up anymore. If you have a cigarette, it's like almost a, a triggering thing. Whereas with drugs, it's okay. Yeah, um, I think we can work on that. And I think that shouldn't be a good use of some of, some of the money. And I, I wanted to go back, though, and mention something that I, speaking about money that I think Ambassador Patterson mentioned earlier, which is that we've been behind the curb consistently on the illicit financing. All this money that gets made in the United States, somehow it gets back to the cartels, right? Whether it's for cocaine or fentanyl or, or, or meth from Mexico also. Mexico is also the largest supplier of meth into the United States. We've got to get smarter on getting these proceeds. And there are a lot of new ways that they're moving it through cryptocurrencies and, 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 and they've been moving it through trade, uh, you know, third party trades and things like that for a long time. But we just have to also put more resources into that. And because that undermines not only harms Americans, but it harms uh, the societies back where the cartels are operating because it allows them to buy more guns. It allows them to pay for more corruption in those societies. And 
I think we could also probably publicize this, how much money is being made and is then supporting criminal activity in the U.S. and elsewhere. There's some really interesting comments and questions. Uh, I really appreciate the thoughtful comments that are being put out. Um, so there's some stories about, I think there's a series of the drug traffickers do other bad things and are often sort of not linked. So if you care, to, care about environmental stewardship, I can guarantee you that drug production is not done in an environmentally friendly way. I guarantee you that. If you're concerned about trafficking in persons, that you, you should be concerned about the illicit narcotics. If you're concerned about uncontrolled migration and sort of illicit migration, you should be concerned about, if you're cared about illegal or illegal mining, this relates to that. If you're concerned about IUU fishing or the trafficking in wildlife parts, you should be concerned about this. Could you each just comment a little bit on sort of the inner the interconnectivity, if I could use the term intersectionality, it's not my favorite word, but the interconnectivity about the interconnectivity of illegal narcotics and sort of these other global bads, please, including corruption. Let me start with you, Admiral. I think it, uh, that's going to be a good point of view because uh, there are today there is a lot of ambientalists, and many people that are very concerned about the about the jungle, about to, how to protect the Amazons, and. We need to tell those ambientalists, matter of fact, they have a lot of power because they, they, they have money and they have a, how to spread the, the news. How bad is to have an hectare of coca plants? How much jungle needs to devastate to do that? How can affect the rivers in the jungle using the chemicals because the chemicals are finally verted to the rivers and that people also is involved as illegal uh, mining uh, using another chemicals that are very harmful for the land for the rivers so we need to be more smart uh, talking those ambientalists uh, talking the society today how bad is the drug it's not just the it's not just the gram of cocaine in the streets. It's the process. It's how bad uh, is how bad the process is to destroy animals, to destroy the plants, to destroy the trees in the jungle. That are, that needs maybe some of them hundreds of years to recover. Thank you. I, this gets zero coverage, Admiral. The environmental community could make common cause on illicit narcotics. And I, I frankly consider the silence deafening. And I think there's an opportunity to, to create a new coalition that includes public health folks, folks who are concerned about national security, people who don't like illicit narcotics, and then folks who um, are concerned about the environment. And it seems to me that if you are concerned about the environment, you should hate illicit narcotics because of the environmental damage it does. I never hear that argument ever, and I think it's a mistake. So thank you, Admiral, for raising that. Ambassador Patterson. So on the connections between these these criminal gangs, this was very dramatic in Colombia, and and the the real nexus of this, or the what the real is the corruption in the law enforcement and police, because they're bought off across the board. Um, there were great links between kidnapping and narcotics trafficking, and. Uh, um, general criminality, shakedowns, extortion, mafia type tactics. It was all, it was all, one, but you need slightly different tactics and, and programs to, to address these various criminal gangs. And as the animal says, intelligence. So there's no doubt that this promotes the drugs because they generate so much money, promotes a, a general um, environment of criminality. And one thing we haven't talked about much, the economic effects of this, how this crowds out legitimate exports and a legitimate economy and makes it very hard for the government to raise revenue to, to combat this. Uh, the economic effect, effects are really quite far reaching when this sort of thing takes hold. Thank you. Ambassador Wayne. Well, just to pick up on Ambassador Patterson's last point. So in recent months, We've had uh, or 
criminal gangs in Mexico interfering and taking money from the avocado producers, sending avocados to the United States. We've had uh, violence in the streets where they're trying to extort small businesses in major cities on a regular basis. We've even had reports that they're claiming control of the water sources in areas having a drought where the, the local residents have to pay to the local cartel to be able to get water going forward. And then their regular road tolls for the drivers of trucks and others going down certain roads. So these, these groups may be drug traffickers on certain days and they look for other sources of money on other days. And, and it is just crea it creates an environment of criminality. And as, as Ambassador Patterson said, they use their extra money to buy off or scare, and sometimes a combination, scare the local police and local authorities not to do anything to react to that. Um, we've seen also when the migration flows grew from Central America and now from other countries in Latin America and the rest of the world, the criminal groups saw this as a way to move money. And so what were often small mom and pop human smugglers were replaced by <clears throat> well-organized smugglers who were renting bu you know, buses and other things to move people. And, and there were tolls put on by the drug cartels near the border. If they wanted to get to the border and get across, they had to pay extra money. So what these groups do is they will move into all sorts of illicit activities where they can make some extra, some extra money, even if their prime activity is trying to get drugs into the United States. I thought there was a comment in here about cancel culture and former ambassador, to, Colombian ambassador to the United States talk, used to talk about having a cancel culture for drug trafficking and drug use. So I would like to put on the table that there are, there are groups in our society that have the power to cancel others. They have some kind of special moral authority. I don't have this, but there are groups in our society that should say that if you, if you care about environmental stewardship, you hate corruption, um, you are worried about what's going on to poor people in the United States, you're, compare, you're worried about what are happening to minority communities in the United States, you're compare, compare, com concerned about what's happening to rural communities in the United States, we should call these people out as evil and they should be canceled. We should be folks that have that kind of moral authority and I don't should be canceling these people. They should be canceling drug traffickers and should be canceling drug use. So I, I associate myself with that anonymous attendee comment. Thank you very much. Let me go to one last point for this group, which is about uh, public health. So I think oftentimes this is framed as this is, um, this is a straight up public health problem, that this is, should just be treated as only a public health problem. So there's a question here about what are your thoughts about partnering with public health authorities to do a better job of targeting opioids, especially fentanyl trafficking using big data analysis. But let's just use it more broadly. What does a partnership with public health authorities look like? Because we haven't talked much about that in this conversation today. I'll give you each a chance to to make this, this this comment and also give you a chance to make any parting thoughts because I think we're running out of time. So each of you has, Ambassador Wayne, let me start with you. Well, I think the United States really does need to invest in better data collection, especially on the, the uh, demand side. For a long time, we have not tracked where all the drug abuse has been. We had clearly, we hadn't been tracking the over sales of opioids because remember this, this wave of addiction started with legal opioids being sold in illegal or, or un immoral amounts by pharmacies and others to those who were abusing them. We weren't tracking it. And the DEA who tried to track it got in trouble for tracking it. So we need to get a lot smarter and a lot better at using that data so we can respond right away on this on this, the US citizen side of abuse and the need for help and surging help into certain counties and certain communities where there, there's a, a rise in abuse. So that's, that's certainly one area that we could do that. I, I think if we could get to a better position internationally at tracking chemical precursors, for example, and collecting data on these precursors when they leave certain ports and then where they end up 
that could also be a help on the other side of this. So I think a lot of places along the line, big data could be a, a, a great help. And that includes in the money laundering part of what we're dealing with here. Okay, Ambassador Patterson. I think that's totally correct. And, and I, I think that would be an excellent initiative to take to collect more data from, from our partners and to help them improve data collection. We do that on the economy. You know, we teach them how to do wage and wage surveys and other things like this, not in Latin America, which is a very sophisticated, uh, uh, is very sophisticated civil service. But this seems to be an area ripe for, ripe for exploitation overseas and, and cooperation that would be essentially uh, broadly supported. Thanks, Ambassador. Admiral, I'm gonna give you the last word. Thank you, Dan. I think that the, 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 the fentanyl, for example, could be a legal drug, but enters an illegal market. And that's when crossing that border is when there needs to be tracker. When, the, when crossing the border from legal market to illegal market. But the cocaine in the other side is always illegal. Always. It's not, it's not cocaine that I sell in any pharmacy or it's not cocaine that is legal. So all are illegal and needs to be addressed a different way. And the, the other, and the other side is how bad is each drug for to be, uh, addicted in cocaine needs a large consumption of that for the fentanyl it's just a few doses very few doses to become an addicted and and an addicted from cocaine uh can be recovered but addicted from fentanyl very very hard to recover very hard to recover uh, we need to show that and we need to uh work this from the from the uh all authorities all authorities in the country needs to share that information and to put it in one place and like uh, the dia uh, working in that and tracking the people who are dealing with those drugs Thank you. I really want to thank the panelists. This has been a really great conversation. I'm so grateful to the three of you. Thank you so much for helping me with this. I think this is a very important conversation. I, I would like to have a bipartisan, thoughtful, robust conversation, reset the consensus, and then engage our partners across a number of different dimensions. And I know there's some progress in some areas uh, with the current administration. I think there's opportunities for us to do better in others. So I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for tuning in today. Thank you.